I do think the narrative is wrong. I do think that my previously contrarian view, right, a hard landing, is is more vi more visibly back on the table. Team no landing is gone. It's debate now in the mainstream, not just me, but mainstream between soft landing, hard landing. And I do think that we're going to see uh, more capitulation from team soft landing. And then that really leaves the question of when do the money helicopters fly? You asked about gold and am I worried about it being at, at all time highs? My answers are it's not real all time highs. And I look not so much at the technical charts, but I look at the fundamentals and everything here to me, I, I don't see the fundamental that's bearish for gold right now. I, it's just not on the table. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Edge Air Mining Guy on X and, of course, your host for this conversation. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back Lobo Tigre. He's the, uh, the independent speculator, probably the most... What do you call it? Like the most returning guest, the guy, the, the guest who we've had on the most, but I've really, really enjoyed chatting with him. Uh, he, he's fantastic. Like, although he claims he's not an economist, but uh, we, we, I love discussing the economy <laughs> with him. And of course, we're going to talk gold, silver. I'll, I'll throw in a question about uranium as well. And of course, we need to talk sentiment and junior mining. Curious uh, if he mirrors my, my impression from uh, the Beaver Curry conference. Um, whether it's junior mining sentiment is, is slightly ticking up and whether we're on to uh, greener pastures here uh, over the coming months. Really curious what his thoughts are on that. But uh, before I switch over to my guests, you guys know the spiel. Kindly hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously. It's not just a vanity factor. It helps us out broadening our reach and uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you so much for that. Now, without much further ado, Lobit, it's fantastic to have you back on the program. It's good to see you. Happy to be on the show, Kai. Yeah, really looking forward to the discussion with you because uh, we have a bit to catch up on. We last spoke uh, in mid-July, uh, pretty much when the S&P 500 peaked um, at about 5,700, 5,710 points. Since then, we've had a Fed rate cut. And, uh, you know, back in July, we only speculated about what that would do. Now we have some facts and, uh, Lower, we need to investigate how is the market behaved? How is gold behaved following that rate cut? Was everything already priced in? <laughs> well, clearly not. If you look at gold, starting with that one, not priced in. Uh, but there's an interesting part that you haven't brought up was that July. July was about when the long and variable lags, if they lasted an average length, which in the U.S. is said to be around 27 months, kind of depends on whose numbers you look at. But from the beginning of the rate tightening cycle, that average length of a long and variable lag would have ended or that would have hit around July. And lo and behold, as you're saying, you know, there's a there's a peak there. But also, I think perhaps not coincidentally, but more importantly, that's when the cracks in the labor market really started showing up. Thing that a thing that I had long been saying this is going to happen. This one apparent source of strength in American exceptionalism, this uh, consumer that won't stop spending because the job market is so tight. You know, when that cracks, things start changing. That started in July. And the cracks, you know, now they've gotten big enough that the mainstream is is admitting it. You know, the, the 818,000 jobs that just disappeared right <laughs> on that revision. Um, so important point is, in many ways, we're on we're on track here for the outlook. The other point would be the cracks started to appear in July. They're widening now. People are admitting it more now, but they didn't just appear this month. They've been widening since July. I think that makes for a trend, and I think that has a lot of investment implications. So which way do you want to go from there? Yeah, I think we can stay on that for a second because we briefly talked about it. When when would when when should one get nervous uh, about the unemployment numbers? And uh, I, I briefly watched or like watched some uh, the highlight reel of the Fed press conference, uh, and it seemed like Jerome Powell was starting to get nervous about about the unemployment number. And uh, as I, I think we've discussed that before, Lobo as well, always behind the eight ball when it comes to unemployment numbers. Then the odd revision comes in, right and. Uh, he, he called 4.4 percent might be the top um, in, in the unemployment, uh, what is it called, unemployment rate here. But uh, he also hinted that there will be more cutting coming ahead. So he, he's he's he seemed worried about the unemployment rate. Is that well, something you, you you think as well? I think actions speak louder than words. And the Fed cutting 50 to begin with absolutely smacks of worry to me. You know, not desperate panic. I mean, maybe they are behind the scenes, but not not showing it. I actually thought that Powell deserved an Oscar for his performance in that press conference. 
he basically seems to have persuaded, at least for the moment, many investors that starting with a 50 point cut out of the gate, well, this is everything's fine. There's nothing wrong here. Move along now. It is not fine. They, they don't do that for no reason. And people say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're just normalizing or they're getting down closer to the neutral rate. Well, if that was true, if all they wanted to do was quickly get down to neutral, why didn't they cut 1% or 1.5% right off the bat? That would have got them closer to what they think is neutral. Um, but no, yeah, obviously that's, you know, that would have caused more harm than good. But I, I think, again, actions speak louder than words. The 50 point cut says that there's something, you know, and that even they know that there's something there. You know, I think that these labor things that we've been talking about, this has been long been my call, right? That this was like a one legged stool that the US economy was perched on, was this laborer slash consumer. And once that started to give way, you know, then the recession that we've seen in commodities, the recession we've seen in manufacturing, the recession that we've seen in transportation, you know, the uh, leading economic indicators being negative for two <laughs> years, right? And importantly, you're talking about some of the triggers. You're asked about that. Um, we had the SOM rule triggered, which is a labor market trigger. Now, Claudia SOM herself has been poo-pooing it and saying, oh, this time it's different. But <laughs> she's a government economist, or was, you know, so I take that with a grain of salt. I think even better, though, than the SOM rule is what I call the Gunlock indicator. You and I may have discussed this before, which is Jeff Gunlock, the Bond King's favored measure. And that's basically the three year rolling average of unemployment versus spot, right, the current number. And when those lines cross, it's an indicator of acceleration in the unemployment market. And those lines crossed resoundingly. Um, the, you know, the, the, that has clearly been triggered. And, and here's the thing, both the SOM rule and the gun lock indicator are coincident indicators. They're not leading indicators. They're saying, you know, in, that in hindsight, a year or two from now, the NBER will admit that in August, September of 2024 was when the recession started. So these things are all there for anybody who's paying attention that you know, the idea that, oh, there's nothing wrong, everything's fine, is just farcical. And somehow Powell pulled that off. So you, know, you take that one, you know, one way or the other, but the, but the indicators are there. And are there contraindicators? Sure. The Atlanta Fed says that the US GDP now is around 3%. You know, great growth for a big economy like the US. Well, okay. If you believe the Atlanta Fed now, <laughs> you know, the, again, government statistics, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. And then there's government statistics. Right. So, uh, look, I don't pretend, uh, as you pointed out in your intro, I'm not an economist. I'm a due diligence guy. You know, my expertise is in kicking rocks and picking stocks. But since the profession of economy has broken models and they are so bad at what they do overall, I think every investor has to, in self-defense, um, become a bit of an amateur uh, economist. So, you know, do I get everything right? No. But I tell you what, I've got a better track record at predicting recessions than the Fed does because they've never done it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. And uh, you correctly predicted, by the way, the 50 basis point cut. Like, well, the market. No, nope, like, sorry. After I got it. No, nope, no. Nope, sorry. I was in the 25 camp. Hold on, I got I got the notes here from our July interview. Here, let me. Yo, did I really let say? Let me pull that up. Hold yeah, on. I must That's have what, said it was possible. Uh, da, da, yeah, this could involve, like, of course, as as good interview guests, you know, you always leave a back door <laughs> open for all eventual eventualities. But uh, you sort of involve. You you mentioned this could involve a fifty basis point cut by September, like a proper bona fide Fed pivot. Uh -huh. Um, would it would include that and. Uh, I, I was in that camp as well, based on the unemployment uh, rates. So. Thank you for saying that, Kai. I'm not going to cherry pick. <laughs> I, I must say that in my free weekly letter, I had been saying before the, the Fed meeting, like more recently, I had been saying that 25 seemed likely. Now, the reasons for what I said, you know, the Fed pivot and the 50 and more, I think they're still there. Like this labor market coming apart. If I'm right about this, we're going to see a lot more cuts. And, you know, we're going to see a, a, a substantial shift in policy. Uh, but according to the numbers that they admit to, right, you know, I, I'm an independent thinker. You can say I've got a tinfoil hat on, whatever you like. But I don't accept 
the GDP now cast from the Atlanta Fed. And I don't accept much of the narrative. I think the employment numbers are much worse than the government admits to. Like even if you use the U6 number, which is what the unemployment number used to be before 1994, um, you know, that's over 7%. So even according to the way the government used to call unemployment and still measures it itself, like taking the other side's number, things are much worse than they're letting on. You know, and so when people say, oh, unemployment's lower, it's historically low, it's near 50 year low. Well, no, it's not, because the way we counted it 50 years ago was not U3, what we use now, it was what we are close to what we now call U6. So anyway, uh, you know, all of that is still there on the table. But looking at the numbers that the Fed and the mainstream economists make their prognostications on, you know, the, the overt signs of trouble weren't that strong. So I thought that the 25 was more likely. And sorry, I don't want to beat that to death. But maybe the, the important takeaway from this is that they haven't yet capitulated. They haven't, you know, you know the fact that 818,000 new jobs just disappeared, um, you know, they've acknowledged it, but nobody's really admitting how serious that is. And if you take that and you annualize it, right, it's around 70,000 jobs a month. So if you subtract 70,000 jobs a month from the official numbers that we're getting, the U.S. job growth is not keeping up with the population growth right now. We're, we're actually in a contractionary phase, I think, if you look at it in any kind of objective way, which, of course, you know, you can't count on the fox to guard the chickens. And that's you know how the government works. Um, Again, where do you want to go from that? But I, <laughs> the takeaway is I do think that the narrative or sorry, I do think the narrative is wrong. I do think that my previously contrarian view, right, a hard landing is is more vi more visibly back on the table. Team no landing is gone. It's debate now on the mainstream, not just me, but mainstream between soft landing, and hard landing. And I do think that we're going to see uh, more capitulation from team soft landing. And then that really leaves the question of when do the money helicopters fly? And, and bear in mind that this isn't just the Fed. It's also fiscal policy. And if you talk to Lynn Alden, then you know what, you know, her thesis on fiscal dominance that has huge implications for investors. Now, lots of good points there, Lobo. But uh, it, I really want to discuss the, the implications of what the Fed has done now as well. Like it's, it seems a bit like a drop in the bucket. Personally, like it'll probably take some time for it to trickle through. Um, I'm hearing more problems actually on the real estate side, which I thought might be the first indicator of things turning around yet again or reacting to a to, to a rate cut. But I'm hearing the contrary, more like oh, what was the August number? I think uh, housing starts and uh, no, sorry, existing home sales was the number I was looking at last week. It was the existing home sales was dipping despite everybody expecting a Fed rate cut and lower mortgage rates. So it seems like there's a trend that seems to be accelerating as well. So what is that Fed cut supposed to stop? And uh, can it where, where do we see implications of that Fed cut? Okay, bearing in mind, it's better to ask me about pyrite versus calcopyrite than, you know, housing starts versus permits and stuff. I'm, I'm not a housing guy or a REIT guy. Just um, an example. That was just an but, example but I like to use. That so. said, um, actually, the very most recent numbers that we saw in housing, I thought were a slight improvement, very slight, but a slight improvement. And to me, the, the really interesting thing is, you know, people say, oh, this is going to be great. If, you know, we're, we're easing up and and this will bring costs down and, and CPI is going to come down more. But I, I think, that, you know, be careful what you wish for here. Lower rates could actually increase housing prices because we've had this problem for years of all these people locked in at low mortgages, not wanting to move because if they got any new mortgage, it would be much higher. So you, you've had this, you know, this freeze up in the real estate market. So people are talking about how mortgage rates now are dropping towards the magic number that they assume, think, imagine, hope, pray mm -hmm. is what's going to loosen up the real estate market. If that happens, um, you could see something like a feeding, feeding frenzy, which instead of making housing cheaper, makes it more dear because there's more participants. The demand, the people who don't want to sell now say, oh, well, now I can sell and it's a better market and people can afford their mortgages more. So I'm not going to drop my prices. I'm going to hold my prices high. And the people who are looking to buy might say, well, gee, you know, I've been waiting for more affordable rates since 7%. And, you know, now's my chance. So, okay, I'll hold my nose and I'll pay a higher price because my interest rate will be lower. 
So this could actually boost housing prices. I'm not making a prediction. Again, I'm not a real estate guy. I'm just saying that the assumption that people make that this Fed policy pivot is going to help real estate uh, or rather bring the cost of housing down. It may help the market liquid, become more liquid, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll bring the cost of housing down, which is a huge component of CPI. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. Like I'm just looking at the, the United States new home average sales price over here, and it, it has been declining, but it's, it's dropped from, let's say, 526,000 to 517,000. So <laughs> does that Ooh, make a big difference? Stuff. Like there is a trend, <laughs> but I think uh, we, we can agree that housing hasn't really come off, especially in, in popular areas, of course. Um, areas where, the, that's, let's call it the, the COVID run-up happened, like Florida, Austin, or places in Texas. Prices haven't come down. Or sorry, prices are sorry. Prices are coming down in those areas because people are selling their COVID properties. Let's call them that. But in other markets, I don't, I don't see that happening. So I find that quite interesting. What what that will do, and uh, as as you said, I think inflation will will stay high if we include housing, and prices will stay high. Like why why would they drop? Like as as you said, like there's no correction. Like there was nothing to change in in that regard. So. But again, and then the, the other big understand. input to CPI, sorry, switch gears, but I'm just thinking because this is so important for CPI. And again, yeah. CPI is a bogus number. I get that. But it's it's what Wall Street cues off of. So if you're going to play in the markets, if you're going to buy and sell stocks and bonds and things or whatever, you can't just ignore the data that, you know, the big funds and the majority of the investors cue off of. So. So this housing question, I think, is very important. The other one is um, energy prices and oil in particular. And, you know, gasoline both has a big impact on CPI, but it has a big impact on the psyche of the consumer out there. And if you think about it, with a hot war in the Middle East escalating, it's really astounding that oil is only $70 a barrel. If, if you had told me, a year ago, which would be before the October, you know, horrific uh, events in Israel and Hamas, their, you know, kidnapping and all this stuff. Um, if you had told me a year ago before that happened, that something like that could happen and Israel would have just, you know, attacked thousands of Hezbollah operatives in, ba in Lebanon and be bombing in Beirut and around Lebanon now, plus a ground war in Gaza. And it, you know, I would have thought that oil would be triple digits for sure. And and I think most analysts would have thought that the fact that it isn't, I think, actually underscores just how weak global demand is in an environment like that. And, and it's not just, oh, there's a war and it could be bad for oil. I mean, there's a war and it has through the Houthis shut down uh, or restricted shipping through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. I mean, it is having an impact. Um, and that's not to mention the other war <laughs> and what's happening with, you know, Russian supply of fuel and, and that. So I, I, I think that the uh, deflationistas or disinflationistas have been getting a helping hand from oil prices in particular, but energy not jumping as much as it normally would under these kinds of geopolitical uh, circumstances. But I don't know how long that that holds and if it heats up much more and it is heating up as you and I record. Um, I, again, I'm not making a prediction here. I'm, I'm just saying that the team soft landing has benefited from an extraordinary circumstance. And, you know, what, you know if you're if you're projecting, if you're speculating, you're casting forward in the future, you want to bet on an extraordinary circumstance continuing or a more return to normalcy. And so what I'm saying is that's a long-winded way of saying is I do think that oil prices will tick back up. You know, if we go into full-blown uh, recession or if the recession deniers, as I call them, capitulate, right? And people have that, oh my God, moment. Yeah, oil will, will, oil will go down, energy will go down, copper, industrial minerals. The, the, the instant reaction will be down. But once that sorts out, I mean, the, the fact that we've got war in the Middle East, I think, and still voluntary supply constraint on the big producers, I think argues for higher oil ahead. And if the war in the Middle East gets hot enough, it could even overcome the recessionary ne negatives that I see potentially in the very near term. Uh, long and short of it is I'm not rushing out to buy oil stocks to get today. So please don't take what I just said as a recommendation to go buy, buy an oil ETF or something, you know, right now. 
That's that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I want to watch and see how this balance plays out. I think the recession is more certain right now, and that's bearish for oil in the near term. But if the war heats up more and we start seeing oil take off despite economic factors, then, then I think the war trumps the recession, at least as far as oil goes. I, I, I tend to agree. And I called uh, low oil prices at some point QE for the people, right? And because uh, it feels like we're getting some money back. Like even here in Germany, gas prices are down roughly 25% from its peak or from their peaks, which is tremendous given the how much taxes on those old price on on the gas price over here as well uh, i think we're paying a euro 65 a liter right now so you you do the math it's still probably two times as high as in the u.s if you convert it into gallons in u.s dollars given all the forex and all those i think what is a gallon three and a half liters so you do the math three and a half times 1.65 Everybody's got a calculator at home. Put it in the comments down below so we can share that with everybody. But uh, it, it is interesting. It is QE for the people and to trying to keep people engaged in the service sector humming, especially in the U.S., is important where the gallon costs like a $2.80 right now. So, and uh, but, but interesting fact, I'm curious if it ticks up now after the summer, uh, more of a psychological factor because people were traveling and uh, maybe the U.S. wanted to keep people happy over the summer so that they could travel. I'm curious if that ticks up because, as you said, like I personally think we should be – triple digits uh, as well, like $100 easily based on what we've been seeing. But um, I think I interviewed Doomberg uh, like six months ago, and t he mentioned the U.S. is very strong in domestic supply. So it, it is independent from what is happening in the Middle East to a degree. It is, uh, I don't know, there is a bit of a moat perhaps, and that's why prices haven't reacted as, as <laughs> much. Is that something you would agree to that thesis? I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, yeah. Um... Of course, the U.S. has been selling LNG or more LNG, trying to, to sell it to Europe. U.S. being a major producer, of course, it's more self-sufficient. That does insulate things. But these are global commodities and they're fungible. So if you know demand really spikes up globally, there'll be more demand for offtake from the U.S. and that'll push the marginal price up in the U.S. It's not like the U.S. has one price for exports and one price for domestic consumption. So in a way, this could be sort of like uh, Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake. You could think of it as an oil milkshake because it flows so readily from from wherever is cheaper to where is more dear. So, yeah, but it's it's, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't bank on that for for keeping, you know, I mean, OK, gas, which is more regional. Right. We, we get negative prices sometimes <laughs> if there's a downpipe you know, disruption or something and gas prices will spike negative. Uh, you know, that's more regional, but, but petroleum products. Yeah. I, I, my thinking is more global other than, you know, brief momentary uh, in disruptions. Yeah. Another topic we could probably spend another hour on is the deal or the electrification that has slowed down of all the EVs. Like Volkswagen is making the news that uh, there's not enough demand for electric vehicles. They got to let 30,000 people go here in Germany. I think that's another topic that I'm quite keen on to, to, to discuss at another time about the oil price because the demand is not going away, is my point. So it yeah. won't completely implode. Like, uh, you know, it won't disappear overnight, like so many people predicted. Wait, you mean the demand for oil or the demand yeah. for the EVs? Oh, for, for gas, sorry. The demand right. for oil okay. won't just evaporate right. because yes. uh, no, everybody's I'm, driving electric cars. I'm in now, that. Right? And, and again, to give credit where due, Lynn Alden was the first one I saw make the comparison between oil and the tobacco companies back when tobacco became, you know, persona non grata. And the industry became starved of capital and, you know, few survivors, but the smokers still smoked. So the demand for the product didn't go away. But supply got constrained. And ironically, the anti-smoking crowd made a lot of money for investors in the companies that were able to meet the demand. I see the exact same thing happening in oil. It's an excellent metaphor. The capital has been constrained already. Uh, you know, <laughs> the current administration couldn't understand why American producers didn't drill more when, when prices were high. At the same time, ratcheting up the regulations and yanking licenses and making it difficult for them to apply for new ones. So, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, not to get too political, but I just, I just remember. Do you remember? I know that you're German, but you know we look at the U.S. because it's a bellwether. It sets the prices or the trends for commodities, and most of them are quoted in dollars. So we have to pay attention to what the U.S. does and and how it impacts the U.S. dollar. Though I do understand that the world is larger than the U.S.
But do you remember when Biden gave his State of the Union address a few years ago? And and he thought he was being conciliatory. He thought he was offering an olive branch when he says, oh, I understand we're going to need oil for at least 10 more years. <laughs> Exactly. Like one half of the of the Congress just erupted in laughter because it was such a clueless and out of touch statement to make. But if you drink the, you know, the e environmental extremist Kool-Aid, I mean, that's that's the mindset that's so disconnected from reality. But the, the point is to agree with you. Yeah. And but and, and the and the Lynn Alden point, though, is that this is a source of opportunity. Because it's necessary, it's not going away. Sorry, Mr. Biden, it's going to take ten more than ten years, even if you build all the windmills you want. Um, and 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 so the people that have the goods, the companies that have the reserves and have the ability to, you know, the pipe, you know, all that stuff, the better players in this space, I think, uh, offer potential for excellent returns. But. I'm personally very keen to go there, but not until I'm sure that the recession has done its worst. Once the recession deniers really capitulate and people say, oh my gosh, you know, we will see almost guaranteed a, a negative spike in almost everything. Um, but then afterwards, afterwards, then all this stuff comes into play. After the recession, I like to say the two absolute no brainers in my mind are oil and copper. Everything else, monetary metals are different. I'm talking industrial minerals and energy commodities. Well, we can talk about uranium too. But anyway, like lithium or nickel or whatever, I want to see what is the market doing at that time? How is the, you know, are the EVs coming back on the other side of the recession? They may or they may not. We don't know. But even if they don't, copper's coming back, oil's coming back. I have no question given the dynamics of supply and demand in both of those commodities. They're both no-brainer buys as soon as I'm confident it's time to start buying industrial minerals again. No, fu fully agree. I'm really curious what the copper price is doing. It's already decently at a decent level. What is it, 430 a pound right now? So it's not far off from the $5 top where, that we've well, seen. Well, it backed off quite a bit. It's bounced off recently. Interestingly enough, the, the Fed rate cut that, that we started this conversation with had a positive impact. But don't kid yourself. If you know, you know, if I'm right about the recession, you know, being becoming more and more evident that we're headed for a hard landing, like the next employment numbers coming in lower. And remember, we've got until November for another Fed meeting. So there's quite a few data points here to come. If if the labor market keeps softening the way I think it will, you know, these curves when the labor market turns and unemployment goes up, it's you know, in almost a hundred years, that always accelerates. And when people say, oh, look, it's still low. It's fine. It's fine. That's not the point. The point is that it, you know, you're talking about still low at the beginning of a hockey stick <laughs> and the hockey stick always goes up. So that's where we are now. That's why I'm confident that we're going to see scarier numbers on the employment front in the next month or two. And, and, and then we'll see. It's interesting. You keep mentioning like soft landing, recession, and uh, one thing I've noticed in the in the recent weeks here in the in the media and the financial mainstream media that I follow as well. I have to. Uh, it's partially it's my job as well. But uh, I've been reading terms like prolonged downturn, soft landing. I've been reading more of those terms in the headlines lately, and one of them right now I'm just looking at is luxury stocks slip as fears grow of a prolonged downturn. Those are those are terms and headlines I haven't seen before. Right. It was more right. no the, landing, the no worries of, about the it. The center of gravity. I can't say I was a lone wolf because <laughs> Peter Schiff and some other, you know, uh, hard money advocates out there have been in with me on team hard landing. But, you know, we're the tinfoil hat crowd as far as the, the Fed is concerned and, and so on. So for the mainstream, we have been lone wolves, scattered lone wolves out there. <laughs> uh, and now the, the center of gravity of the conversation is shifting in our direction. You know, we're, we're not shifting in the direction of, oh, yeah, maybe things are much better than we thought. They're shifting in the direction of, oh, maybe things aren't as great as we thought. And, and I think to the beginning of our conversation, the, the Fed's 50 point cut, actions speak louder than words. Uh, you know, Powell did a, a great job sounding confident and everything's fine, but actions speak louder than words. And I, I think we're going to see that borne out in the numbers going forward.
No, well, you tried earlier in the conversation to to bring in gold into the into the into the mix here. Now now we're going to spend some time on it because I'm really curious what your thoughts are on the gold price. We're, we're every day it's a new record all time high here for the gold price. So we're a bit spoiled, but of course, like I'm trying to understand how much momentum is left. And uh, I asked you before about the general market, but how much is priced in? Fifty basis point cut or another fifty basis point cut by the end of the year is supposed to happen. Um, and geopolitical events as well. So I'm curious. They, sorry, let me, let me add a third topic as well as the Dixie, <laughs> the U.S. dollar. And um, I'm really curious to, to get all those three things into the mix. Like, how much gas does gold have left in the tank, and what what price levels should we be maybe expecting? Well, you know, I don't like to do predictions. The prediction racket is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> uh, am I nervous about all time highs here? No, they're nominal all time highs. Actually, um, I need to publish this chart somewhere. I don't think I put it in the free digest because I just put it in the in the independent speculator. But I need to publish this chart. If you look at gold adjusted for inflation, and that's just using the government CPI, not any real, <laughs> real more realistic number <laughs> for inflation. Um, gold is not at an all time high. Gold is just barely uh, almost it hasn't yet, but it's almost back to the 2011 high and to take out the 1980 high it would need to go over $3,400 an ounce. So if you want to talk about, you know, okay, now gold is really, and I mean that in the economic sense, it's really high, then you're talking well north of $3,000 an ounce on the exchange rate. And so we're, we're, we're well below that. Now, you know, that said, you know, I, I don't want to be the cheerleader who says, oh, yeah, buy an all-time high. It's fine. It can only go higher. So please don't take that wrong. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I don't want to lead a herd of lemmings off a, a huge cliff. What I can say, so by that I mean, can it go down? Yes. Can it correct before it goes on to real all-time highs? Absolutely. Um, am I nervous about that right now? Actually not. I, I, was, I remember in 2011 when gold really just went on a tear and you know bear in mind that 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 rip up to 1900 was more than double in nominal prices the 1980 peak so if you if you look peak to peak gold double didn't just surpass the 1980 peak it doubled it in nominal dollar terms to do that again this time actually implies like 3800 dollar gold so we're well below that. And, and so if, if you're worried about, OK, we have this big peak like 1980 or this big peak like 2011. Well, to to be at that level of worry, what I'm saying, I'm not saying gold's going to 3,800. I'm saying to be at that extreme of peakiness, if you will, we'd have to be up at 3,800. And we're well below that right now. Um, but that's not really why I'm I'm not nervous these days. I, I'm, I'm not a chartist. I'm, I'm not a TA. I'm a fundamentalist. And I look at what's going on in the world today. You know, the two hot wars, either of which could become World War III. Um, you know, the Fed going into a loosening cycle, which has always been good for gold. You know, what happens into the recession is another matter. But when the Fed pivots and starts loosening, because gold doesn't pay interest, right, that's always been good for gold. And we have also the the global south, the central banks buying gold hand over fist. This business with the weaponization of the dollar, um, that's big. It, and it's it's never happened before, and it is it is clearly you know visibly causing a a, a large and persistent buyer that wasn't really in the marketplace before to, to um, pick up slack. Now, I mean, gold gold went from 2000 to 24, 2500 this year before the labor market started, you know, these before the long and variable lags came due, before the labor market started to crack, as I said it would with you on this show, right? You know, that started happening in July, August. And gold had already pulled a hockey stick before then because of this completely different factor, the global South buying hand over fist. I also think this year that uh, not just sovereigns, and central banks, but I think big money around the world is starting to allocate to gold. Uh, you know, people say, oh, well, neither war has really blown over yet, uh, you know, or blown up yet. So it's, it's not that big a deal. No, I think the fact that they're happening there and they're not going away. Anybody, you know, think, think of, imagine, I don't know how wealthy your family is. Uh, 
Kai, so I don't want to insult or, or compliment anybody unduly here. But imagine that you came from really old wealth, like your great, 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 whatever grandfather was the, you know, Duke of somewhere in, in Bavaria or something. And, and you've got a castle and you've got vaults full of gold and all this stuff and whatever you've, you know, you've got old money, deep pockets that go way back. And the last thing in the world you want to do is lose it, right? You don't want to be the guy who, who squanders the family fortune. And you look at the world today and do you, you can imagine looking at the world and they say, yeah, no, we don't need no more stinking gold. You know, let's buy NVIDIA instead. Right? You're going to you're going to make that bet with the family fortune that goes back a thousand years. I don't think so. Right. Depends if I'm the third generation or not. Right. So, well, OK, <laughs> I understand the reference. But, but you hear what I'm saying, I think. You know, and I don't and it's not just I think around the world. This is a, a thing that our friend Rick Rule likes to say, that the, the global allocation to gold over the decades, like four or five decades, is around two percent. And recently it's been around half a percent. So it doesn't need to go nuts with everybody becoming gold bugs, but a simple reversion to the mean implies a 4x demand, four times more investment demand for gold. I don't know that it even needs to revert to mean. If it goes halfway back, just a little bit, you know, a greater sense of people saying, you know what, the world's kind of scary. It wouldn't hurt to hedge my bets with something governments can't print. And by the way, still works if the electricity and the internet turns off. So and it doesn't take much of that to, to literally double. If you go from a half a percent to 1%, just 1% global portfolio allocation to gold, that doubles investment demand. Um, and I'm getting off the side of the side point here, but you asked about gold and am I worried about it being at, at all time highs? And my answers are, it's not real all time highs. And I look not so much at the technical charts, but I look at the fundamentals and everything here to me I don't see the fundamental that's bearish for gold right now. It's just not on the table. So does that guarantee that gold has to go? No, I don't know the future. Um, but I am actively looking to add gold stocks and silver to my portfolio right now. Oh, maybe that's an important point. Sorry, real quick. Notice I said stocks, not bullion. Yeah. Like it's at an all time nominal high. Am I going to go down to the coin shop and buy more ounces today? No, I'll wait for the next pullback. To me, gold bullion and silver, that's savings. That's what I you know, put my rainy day account. Um, and of course, I'll, I'll look for the dips. I, you know, there's never too much savings I can have. I, but I, I'm, if I don't, you know, if I don't have to save in bullion today, then I'm going to look for the dips. But the stocks, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking very actively because despite everything I said about gold, uh, the stocks have underperformed. I think that changes. I think it's starting to change. The the majors are leading the way with better than expected performance, widening margins. I think that does trickle down through the whole sector. And I think the well-deserved skepticism about gold stocks from broader generalist investors will cave uh, as these trends that we've been talking about continue to unfold over the next couple quarters. No, fully agree. And uh, that's where we come from. That's that's our bread and butter business, of course, is gold and mining stocks here. But uh, Lobo, you talked about the weaponization of the dollar in your answer here. And uh, I'm looking at the dollar chart, the Dixie chart in particular, that's uh, the gold versus other currencies. And I'm starting to get a little worried if I was a US dollar investor, because I'm not a chart technician, but it looks like to me the gold, uh, the Dixie is trying to break down, uh, break break to the downside of the 100 point line. And then the next level would be 90. Um, just very, very like or basic uh, technical analysis, but it's tested that level three times now. And we've seen it in gold when we've tested something three times and four times, eventually it breaks down or breaks out, right? Um, the question is what happens to the dollar? You know, do, do you believe it will go to 90? Is it strong enough to fend that off? And uh, of course, as part B of that question, is that extra fuel to the gold rally fire here? Uh, this is kind of like the real estate question. You know, I'm not a forex <laughs> trader. Okay. I'm a due diligence okay, guy. <laughs> but, but just this is like general observation. And Brent Johnson would probably be a, a you know an excellent person to ask this question of. I do not have a DXY target. I would just remind people, as a fundamentalist, right? There are times when gold and the dollar move up together. So, for particularly like geopolitically, you know, the Ukraine war breakout or the second one, or actually both of them, right? The dollar and gold move up at the same time. You know, something scares people and there's a knee jerk reaction to safe havens and rightly or wrongly, that still includes the dollar. So 
there can be times when they both move up together. And by the way, rate tightening cycles, at least this century, have been good for gold and the dollar at the same time. Uh, you know, everybody says that higher rates are bad for gold because gold doesn't pay interest. But if you look back at 2004 and, you know, you look back at, you know, the, the 2020s as very visible examples, it's just not true. Um, but falling rates have been good for gold. That that part does seem to be true. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, so, no, I don't have a dollar forecast. I'm just saying you, you can't bet on it always being opposite. Though generally, of course, gold is still quoted in dollars. So bearish dollar is good for alternatives to the dollar, which include gold. Uh, no, I'd also say that, remember, it's a race to the bottom. And so just today, as you and I are recording, we had pretty negative economic news out of the East, the EU, in Germany in particular, right? The uh, and, But the EU-wide numbers, were, PMIs, were also not so good today. And... So it's silly that that doesn't make the dollar any better. It doesn't make your dollar buy any more food at the store. It's still losing value. But this is a Forex question. If, you, if you're looking at the dollar compared to the euro, the dollar looks better compared to the euro. By the way, just before we started recording, I checked. And the Dixie was up slightly, not much. But it was in the green and gold was up too. Gold was up six bucks. The Dixie was up. Point one or something. I don't know. But they were both up this morning. So that just goes to show you that there can be confounding variables. I guess what I'm saying is though the dollar may deserve to head lower given all the insanity that we're getting from Washington. And by the way, both candidates, the tax and spend candidate and the spend and tax candidate, both of them have highly inflationary agendas of lots of spending coming up. Um, and it's bearish for the dollar. But the dollar's up today because today's headline is, oh, scary economic news out of the EU. Right? So you can't just take these things in a vacuum. So I'm not sure I helped much there. Didn't give mm -hmm. you a target. Uh, but I, I guess if there's a takeaway for the for the mining and, and monetary metals fans out there is uh, don't obsess on the dollar's, you know, wiggles and moves. Look at the big picture. And there are times when the dollar and gold move together. No, I appreciate that. I was like, and I really appreciate your take on that because I'm just looking for tidbits of information, something to hang your head on, maybe to, to predict where, where prices could go, right? So it's like, I'm not expecting price targets or anything. Like, that's way out of my wheelhouse anyway. So I'm just looking at momentum. That's really important. Do we play the momentum to the downside, to the upside? It doesn't really matter to me. It's like, as long as uh, we, we know where, we, we pretend to know where things are okay. headed. Okay. Uh, well, I have another important. idea right. for you then. This is not a today or a tomorrow thing, but as this unwinds, right? We have this race to debase. We have the race mm -hmm. to the bottom. We have this forex question, and there are other forex questions. But euro dollar is a big one. It's an important one. Um, there, the Fed and the ECB are are cutting. The Fed's cut started out on a bigger one than the eurozone cut, right? The ECB cut. So you know that might argue for a, a greater weakening of the dollar. You know, stick that in your in your hat to to think about. But here's the like the the fundamental picture, though, is the EU famously has a lot more social support networks. It can, in a way, handle recession more than the U.S. because it has such general, generous, such more generous than the U.S. Anyway, uh, safe, safety network, the social safety network is there. It hits the U.S. harder. And so on the downs, on the upside that, you know, that's very expensive and it limits Europe's growth on the downside. You know, those safety nets kick in and it it softens its safety net, right? It, you know, it catches people and prevents them from getting as hurt as they might otherwise. So that blunts the impact on the downside. The U.S. having less of that makes the U.S. more vulnerable on the downside. So in the race to debase, in this global, deepening global recession that I think we're in and, and heading deeper into, it may well be that the U.S. suffers more than Europe. I mean, they both suffer, but... You understand what I'm saying? That the safety network factor here may make it hit hard in the U.S., which would make the uh, monetary and fiscal response all the more strong in the U.S., which would be, I think, more bearish dollar than euro. So that that's about as close to a prediction mm -hmm. as I'll get on that. No, I appreciate that. It's like it's, there's, there's always context, different guests, different opinions. We, I, I'm just trying to just like sort of try to figure out like, do we have momentum? 
on the downside where are things headed and uh, i think you've answered that question perfectly there lobo um you you brought up the golden mining stocks and then maybe one of the last topics i want to talk to you about what um is sentiment here in, in in our sector or in my sector and uh, the one you're looking at as well um sentiment like i was at the beaver creek conference and uh, one thing you might have seen it on twitter and x uh, and linkedin i posted it feels like we're in the fifth stage of, of of grief the acceptance stage um and depending on what scale you go by if it's either the fifth or the seventh stage of grief grief but in the seventh stage there's also hope right so uh, acceptance and hope and it feels like that's where we're at a lot of the companies saying hey we got the goods let them come right and i think that's where we're at and uh, the sentiment was really positive like it wasn't euphoric don't get me wrong like it, it's not like there were outrageous like great parties or anything it was subdued you uh, euphoria subdued euphoria that's maybe not a bad term actually but um what, what are your thoughts what are you seeing what are the charts telling you what are you hearing from the companies well i didn't go to beaver creek the most recent conference i did have a guy there and it, i think our feedback jives i have i have my own indicator on this when i go to conferences and people follow me around asking me questions you know, about mining stocks and things that happens all the time. When they follow me into the bathroom, that's when you know it's starting to get me more euphoric. And then, you know, the number of people who follow me into the bathroom, like if it's one guy following me into the bathroom, that's, you know, medium euphoric. If it's two or three, that's very euphoric. If it's if a group follows me into the bathroom, you know, that's when we're in the mania phase of the market. <laughs> so we're not there yet. Um, <laughs> The most recent conference, I think I've only had one guy follow me into the bathroom <laughs> once. So <laughs> not, not there yet. But um, here's the thing. I, to be useful here, I got to say, you know, when we see these nominal highs posted, you know, there are a lot of happy people out there. There's people whose stocks are up. You know, their portfolios are in the green. They're seeing the joy. You know, we're still not really seeing the kind of leverage to the upside in the gold stocks that are our reason for owning them not writ large, you know, a few of them here and there are, are doing things with what they bring to the table themselves, you know, doing things, meaning moving more than gold. But if you compare the GDX to gold, it's just barely kind of tracking, which is, you know, if, if the, if the GDX or if gold stocks aren't going to do more than gold, why take the risk of owning them just buy gold? So you ne we need our gold stocks to outperform gold for them to be worth bothering with. Some are, and the people who bought them, I'm feeling, you know, some very positive sentiment, you know, vibes coming from these people. But I'm also getting a lot of people, and I'll see this posted on X, you know, on a not daily basis, but pretty much every time there's a new nominal all-time high, somebody says, yeah, but these gold stocks aren't doing anything. Well, dear audience, if you're one of those people, you need to look in the mirror and ask yourself who bought those gold stocks, because gold stocks are doing something. And if and, you know the average is actually moving up with gold, if the GDX or the GDXJ is average, those averages are responding to gold. So if your gold stocks are not, then you need to ask yourself something about gold stock selection. Of course, I don't want to just you know move up with gold. I want to outperform that. I want to do better than the than the indices. And historically, on average, I have. But um, what I'm trying to say is if you know, to the degree that we're still suffering from negative sentiment here, I think people need to ask themselves this question. And I'm try not trying to be mean or beat up on you. I'm presenting this with all respect as a learning opportunity. If your stocks are not delivering the joy that they should at, at all-time high gold prices, nominal or otherwise, then you need to, sorry, you need to improve your stock selection. You need to do something to improve that. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm hoping that, you know, I can help with that, but even if it's not me, if it's somebody else, you know, educate yourself with excellent content, like what Kai produces or others, you know, but, but take this as a learning opportunity. Don't, don't just get mad or get disgruntled or go away, you know, learn from it. And if you don't, you're not going to get any better results in the future. And just sort of to mirror what you just said, I think we're just at the early day, early in early innings here. As you said, I think the GDX. I wrote the numbers down last Thursday, so I might be slightly off, but gold was up about twenty six percent, and the GDX thirty percent. And uh, usually we have a one to three lever on on the on the price performance. Historic terms might be one three point two, doesn't matter, but usually one to three. So we got another, we got wait ways to go before it 
before the rally is over is my my point as well so you haven't missed the boat the train is still in the station in my opinion you know maybe the first card has pulled out or the second but i think there's still eight cards left so um make, make sure you get on that that's that's my and do your homework before then as well um lobo i threatened i'll ask you about uranium uh, in the intro and uh, i do have to ask and to see if there's any new developments anything we should be paying attention to and uh, if there are any updates in the sector yeah, since you and I last spoke, um, I was right about Kazatomprom cutting its guidance for next year. They finally did do that. They announced that in late August. And to be fair, I understand that it's not as crystal clear as as uh, bulls would like. You know, they they have changed their production guidance for this year upwards. They have revised their production guidance for 2024 upwards, and they say they're going to produce more in 2025 than in 2024. So they are increasing their production, or they're saying they will. And so far in H1 2024, they did increase production. So it does seem to be happening. You could say, oh, new supply, that's bearish. But <laughs> the increase in 2024 is like half of what they said it would be originally, and same with 2025. So the overall guidance is substantially lower than what they had originally intended. And therefore, supply and demand, right? Pounds that supply side models had indicated were coming to the market are now no longer coming to the market. And this is not just any pounds. These are the pounds from the lowest cost producer, largest and lowest cost producer in the world. These are very important pounds. So for them to disappear, for any of them to disappear, is a big deal, an upward pressure for the market. Um, and then, you know, there's a question as to whether or not they'll be able to do it. They're still saying that they're having problems with uh, delays and, and sulfuric acid supply. They have enough for this year, but not necessarily for next year. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But all of this, I think, is very bullish. And there was a, 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 you know, an instant reaction to the positive on this, but then things settled back down again. And I'm not sure exactly why the market is misreading this. It may be that they have heard people like me or Rick Rule say for many years that $70, $80 would be the incentive price and that they look around and they see not just the big producers ramping mothball production back up again, but the juniors bringing new mines online or mothballed mines online. So you can see that high prices are in the process of at least trying to cure high prices. Uh, Long story short, we've done our research. There's a free uranium report on our website, by the way. If you want to, you can go to independentspeculator.com and download that. And our view is that having looked at it again, and we did re have a fresh look, we don't think that the low-hanging fruit, that you know, the, these mines that can be ramped up or brought online quickly to meet these high prices, we don't think they're actually enough to meet the demand, let alone to satisfy it going forward. And, and But maybe other people don't agree Maybe that's why, whatever the reason, what has actually happened in the real world on a fundamental level is extremely bullish for uranium. And the demand case is going nuts. I mean, China just announced, you know, a couple dozen more reactors that Europe besides Germany is, is shifting more to nuclear. I mean, it, it's happening. I mean, the big news of the day is Microsoft wants to uh, power a new data center restarting Three Mile Island. How's that for a mind blowing headline? Right. So so it's happening. The demand is there. Supply remains constrained. I'm extremely bullish. And this thing with the world's largest and lowest cost producer not delivering to market what it had previously said it would. Not only that, they moved the goalposts. They applied to reduce their permitted production level so they wouldn't be missing it by so much, it, which tells you how intractable the problems they're facing are. So I just think it looks great. And the fact that there is to your sentiment question, bearish sentiment about uranium. People are upset that uranium, despite all these good things, isn't going anywhere, hasn't gone anywhere for months, like months is a long time. Um, you know, I, I just think that's a gift for anybody that missed the big doubling in uranium last year. I think it's a terrific opportunity in the stocks this year. That doesn't mean I say it's going to double again next year. And, and by the way, at the incentive price, it doesn't need to even move up at all for the right companies to make money and deliver for shareholders. Uh, but I do think it goes up and I think the right stocks will deliver handsomely for shareholders. Oh, well, I have to share my favorite headline of the last week with you. And you might've seen it. I'm not sure if you posted about it as well, but uh, 
reading reading that headline and then reading the article made me laugh. I should often financial news makes me cry because sometimes it's just horrible. But uh, U.S. probes uranium imports from China to prevent circumventing Russia, uh, Russian ban. And then I read further in the article, China hasn't imported or sold any uranium to the U.S. for years, and then all of a sudden it just spiked out of nowhere in 2022 wonder what happened there um wonder uh you know if, if there's anything fishy going on but it made me laugh that that article like what, what do you make of that is that any uh is there any context that uh, you can provide with us that i thought it was well, hilarious i think it's clearly political grandstanding you know everybody gets points with voters and it is an election <laughs> year in the united states everybody gets points with voters for beating up on china now and what a great thing if you can ban something from china that they're not sending you anyway so it you get all the points for beating up on China, but you don't actually lose anything, right? You don't, you don't have to find that, that source of supply from somewhere else. I did not see in the article that I read, and I did tweet about, sorry, post about this. Sorry, Elon. <laughs> and I did post about this, and I, and I asked. I said, hey, this looks interesting, but do we actually get any enriched uranium from China? And nobody answered, so I guess that was my answer. Lobo, I just saw that we've been chatting for 55 minutes. <laughs> I, always, I love talking time. with you. It's just awesome. We have so many so many topics we can always talk about. Like it starts with the well, Fed and the market. Next time, invite me to your castle in Bavaria. We'll have a nice German brew and, and do it live. Oh, I'd love that. I'd love that more than anything, to be honest. L Lobo, I'm so appreciative of your time as always. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier, but uh, please advertise yourself a little bit. Where can we find more of your work? Very quickly, independentspeculator.com. I do have a free weekly letter called the Speculator's Digest. You may not like it. You may not agree with me. You may think I wear a tinfoil hat. Fine. Um, the one thing I do promise is that I won't spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. I, ha I hate that. Uh, but you can see how I think and what I'm doing. Uh, macro <laughs> is so unreliable. I don't charge for it. I give out my macro guidance for free. So ha have a look and see what you think. I appreciate it. Lobo, ph phenomenal conversation as always. Can't wait for the next one. And uh, maybe we can make a Fed Day interview finally happen again. And uh, I have to admit, it's always been me that had to reschedule. I do apologize. No worries. I, I, oh, I love our interviews. It's in November and you're going to be busy pre-conference in November. But if I haven't, if I have to admit, I haven't looked at the date, it is in 44 days, whatever is whatever date. I think it's November 8th or something like that. 7th, 7th, November 7th. I actually can yeah. do that. And it's post, right post the U.S. election as well. So we'll have lots to talk yeah. about. Oh, yeah, my goodness. It will be fun to talk about. Yeah. All right. I, I'll probably wear a U.S. flag jacket just for <laughs> for the heck of it, you know. So we'll, we'll have some fun. Lobo, appreciate it. Thank you so much. And, uh, of course, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel. Yes, it is a vanity number down the subscribers down below. But it helps us with visibility so we can get these, inf uh, the, these interviews and this educational content out to a bigger audience. It is much appreciated because I know 80% of you watching are not subscribed. So please help us out. And uh, I, I, I really, really do appreciate it. Leave a comment, leave a like. What do you think is happening? What do you think of the uranium market? What do you think of gold and silver? How much steam is left on the in, the in the kettle or how much gas is left in the tank? You pick your analogy and uh, let us know below. I really want to hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning in. This was a longer one. I always love chatting with Lobo, but uh, thanks for staying. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with lots more. Thank you.